Old Testament reading this morning. So Isaiah chapter 52, and it does tie in with our passage from Romans. Um, so Isaiah 52, if you have your Bibles this morning, please turn with me to that passage. I'll be reading the first 10 verses. And this is speaking of the Lord's coming salvation to his people. And this is fulfilled ultimately and most fully in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So written hundreds of years before the coming of Christ fulfilled in Christ. Isaiah 52. Awake, awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? The rulers will, declares the Lord, and continually, all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in the day they shall know it. It is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they will see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together in singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Amen. And now to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. Entitles everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, and we'll just be focusing in on verses um, eleven through fifteen this morning. That's all. So you know that Paul's writing this, and in this portion, he's speaking, especially for his his kinsmen after his flesh, hoping and praying that they will come to faith, that the Lord will pour out blessings on them. And we'll talk much more about that in the next couple of weeks, um, and it's very timely as well because of the time we find ourselves in as a nation. But for this morning, this is just straight gospel, man. It really is. It's just plain, straight before us. This is what it means to know the Lord and to be saved. So he says this in um, chap or verse chapter 10 and beginning in verse 11. He says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him, that's everyone who believes in Jesus, will not be put to shame. We talked about that last week. And then verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom, whom they not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, right? We just heard that in Isaiah, and here's the fullness of that as well. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you so much, Lord. Thank you for this day bringing us here. Thank you for your word. I just pray, Lord, by your spirit, it would truly, truly penetrate our hearts, our hard hearts, Lord God. Help us to be engaged in our minds, Lord, and and, and with our, our whole person, our whole being, Lord. Put all the distractions away from us. Everything's going on later today, tonight, tomorrow, next week. Help us to focus in solely on you, Lord God. I pray that you would be with me, that you would give me power from your spirit to bring forth your message. Again, that you are honored and glorified. And we are edified, challenged more and more to live for Jesus Christ. And, and convicted where we need to be convicted. Encouraged where we need to be encouraged by your spirit. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's just start right away. He just says there's no distinction. Right away, when it comes to salvation, what's he say here? For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. So at that time, there were basically the, the Jews, God's people, and then everybody else. That would be the Greek or the Gentiles, that kind of thing. He says there's no distinction. You know what that means? 
No distinction. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. What that means, and what Paul's teaching, what Paul's telling us right away, is that means that every single person needs Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Every person needs Christ Jesus. In other words, we're all in the same boat, spiritually speaking. We're all in the same predicament. We all have the same problem. And what is that? Very simply, we're just born in sin. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what we need to come to grips with. That's what we need to understand about ourselves apart from Christ. Spiritually, we are born in sin. It's taught throughout Scripture. One passage, Psalm 51.5, David says, Behold, I was brought forth forth in iniquity. I was brought forth in sin. And in sin did my mother conceive me. So even by nature, our connection with Adam, our fallenness, we all sin. Is there anybody here that can say, I've never sinned? Not once, not in thought, not in word, not in deed. Not one of us can say that. We are born in sin. So it's not about how good we are, how nice we are, how helpful we are, how hard we try, you know, because we do that. That's our natural tendency. It's not about that at all. And do you know why? Because his standard of holiness is perfection. To live without sin. That's it. That's the standard. So the best that you have is not good enough. That's the whole thing about Christianity. We can't try. We don't earn it. That's what's so beautiful about it. We just have to come to grips with the fact that we're sinners and we understand that at this point and understand that we need him. So holiness and perfection is the standard. We can't meet that, which means Romans 3.23. Very simple. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? Some? A few? All. That's encompassing. That's universal. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, this is the bad news. This is the problem. This is our state. This explains so much, even about ourselves, why we do the things we shouldn't do, why we don't do the things we ought to do, why we see so much sin in this world, hatred, evil, violence. What's that? That's a sinful nature. That's us acting upon our inclinations in that way. Salvation in Jesus is not simply for one group, not one ethnicity. It wasn't just for the Jews. It didn't come for the Jews, but for every person, every class, every ethnicity. It doesn't matter. It is His salvation is for sinners. That means me, and that means you. Aren't you happy? Aren't you blessed? Aren't you thankful that Christ came? So number one, he says, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. We're all the same. That's our problem. Then he goes on to say, for he is the same Lord of all, bestowing riches on all who call upon him. Do you know what that means when he says he's the same Lord of all? That's exclusivity. That's exclusive. That means that there is... He is the same Lord. He is the same Savior. He is the Lord of all people. Another way of saying this is that there's no other way of salvation. There's no other Savior. That's the claim that's made exclusive, exclusively of Jesus Christ throughout Scripture, not just here. John 14, 6. Jesus himself says this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So who comes to the Father except through him? Is there another way? Like this is what Jesus is saying. Teaching, Savior, comes to us that there's no other way of salvation except through him. Acts chapter 4, 11 and 12. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in someone else, something else, another place, no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Those are exclusive claims that are made by Scripture. And why is that? Okay, it's one thing to make the claims, but why is it? Why is Jesus the only way? Why is why do we have to come to Jesus Christ in order to obtain salvation? I'm going to tell you why. Because our transgression, because our sin is against the living and true God, against the one who who created us, the one who made us. Your sin isn't against the universe out there. Oh, I've sinned against the universe, so I'm going to go do something, you know, and uh, plant some flowers, and maybe you'll become one with nature. No, our, our sin isn't against Buddha. Our sin isn't against Allah. There, you can't say, oh, Buddha, please save me. Even Buddhists and Hindus, it's a self-salvation. It's like I need to work and you know, follow the teachings in order to be saved. It's not Allah. You sinned against Almighty God. So it's like me, if I, if I came to you and I, and I maligned you and I slandered you and I wrote all over Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, whatever you guys listen to these days, I wrote something that was just not true about you. 
right? And I, and I, and I did that knowingly. And I'm just saying things that, that aren't right. I'm slandering you. Or if I come to your house and I take everything that you have, I'm, I'm coming to your house and I'm taking your possessions for myself. Or if I come over and I, and I just like beat you up and I hit you and I'm angry with you and punching you. What good does it do me if I go and say, well, you know, I did this against you, but I think I'll go plant a tree and that'll make things better. I'm just going to plant a tree in that name or I'm going to go to another person and say, you know what, I'm sorry for what I did, you know, and so what's that person going to say? You didn't, you're sorry to me? You need to go apologize to the one you actually trans- transgressed against. You were created in God's image. You're made in his image. You belong to him in that way. And so we've sinned against him. So in, in other words, our issues with him, we need forgiveness from him to be reconciled to him, to be saved by him. That's why John 3.16 says this, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the world, that's everybody, that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's why it's exclusive. That's why he's the only way. That's why he's the same Lord and the same Savior of all. Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. The angel of the Lord said to them, these are the shepherds in the field, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So here's the deal. Here's the understanding. Only Jesus could do for us what we can never do for ourselves. That's it. And, and that's Christianity. We can never do for ourselves what Jesus Christ has done for us. Every other religion, every other philosophy, every other way is, is, has to do with you doing something in order to earn, in order to hope, in order to wish, pray, right? So for the Hindus, for the Buddhists, what is it? You could, we could put their whole religion, and I know this is simplistic. I'm not trying to reduce it. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, what's the mantra for their whole system? Try, 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 try again. You understand what I'm saying? So for the Hindu, what do you do? It's a matter of trying. It's seeking to live according to these rules, according to these principles, a better way and a better way. So as to do what? So as to get rid of your karma that's been bad so that when you die, you can come back a little bit better, right? Reincarnated. A little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better until I'm fully holy or I'm fully one with, you know, just a droplet in the, in the midst of the sea. That's self-salvation. That's what it is, right? You're doing it yourself in that way. If you're Islamic, you do your best. You do whatever you can. Listen to the Quran, try, try, and then hope that Allah accepts you. If you're New Age, it's about trying to become one with nature, you know, doing the best you can, right? Go and meditate in the middle of the woods somewhere, you know, and, and just try to become a better person in that way, one with nature. Though Those are all ways of trying, of doing. But you see, the reality is only Jesus Christ did for us what we can never do for ourselves. That means he lived a sinless life. He came and lived a life that we can never live. So Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 4.15, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows. He knows what it's like. He knows the temptation. He knows how hard it is and how difficult it is and how easy it is for us to, to, to want to obey, but then easily slip into sin. He understands. He can sympathize with that weakness. Don't you love Christ? He knows. He was fully man like us, tempted in every way, yet without sin. But one in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That is so important to remember. Without sin. He hasn't sinned. You have sinned. We have sinned. He has not sinned. Understand? That's why we need Jesus. Nobody else could do that for us. It's all about us trying. Christ comes down and does for us what we can never do for ourselves. He lived a sinless life. But not only that, he died a substitutionary, sacrificial death, atoning death on the cross. He took the punishment our sin deserves. So when you do something wrong, you deserve to be punished. You deserve that penalty, don't you? Right? That's justice. That's right. Well, we've sinned against the holy God, so we deserve his wrath. We deserve the punishment. We do deserve hell, right? 
But what Jesus did because of his love, John 3.16, took our place on the cross, took the punishment our sin deserved, paid the price fully for our sins as he sacrificed himself. That's beautiful. That's sacrificial. That's atonement. He's in our place. That's substitutionary. We deserve that so much, but he went there for us. See, that's why we love Christianity, because we can't do it. He has done it. First Peter 2, 23 through 25. This is Jesus. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Check this out. He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree, that's on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you are healed. Not by your own righteousness, not by trying, doing better, trying harder. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Do you understand? How do we know this is all true? We know it's true that he's Lord of all in this way because he was raised from the dead on the third day. He rose from the dead, rose from the grave, vindicates, shows that all of this is true. If we have a dead Savior, Paul says, then we might as well just turn out the lights, go party, go live the way we want to because there's nothing really here for us. But he has been raised. He has been resurrected. And this is true. Salvation is not something that anyone can earn, merit, deserve. It's a free gift to everyone who by grace Repents, believes, receives, and rests on Jesus Christ. That's the hope. That's Christianity. That's what it is. That's what Christ has done for us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tell us this. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, not something that I do, so that no one may boast. Because the minute you say, hey, I'm pretty good. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. No, 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 that's boast. No, no. You can't boast because you're not perfect in every way. Only Jesus Christ was and is. Okay? Simple. Right there. He goes on to say this. Bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. When you call upon him, everything changes. When he changes you, everything changes in your life. When he says bestowing his riches upon us, that's like kind of a, it met, it's kind of goes back to war, like the, the, to the victors go the spoils. When you conquer, everything's yours. You get everything. An illustration for today might be like, you know, going from desperate poverty, you know, just being chronically poor with nothing at all in this life to, to gaining a massive inheritance. That's what it's like spiritually for us. That's what it means when he says he bestows his riches on us. Do you understand that? Because spiritually, apart from Christ, you are poor. You are lost. You are helpless. You're restless. You're searching. You're looking. You're hoping for something. But in fact, you're helpless. And you are without hope. And that's what we are apart from Christ. But when he bestows those riches on us, as we believe in him, guess what? Now you become a beloved child of God. You're rich with his love. You're rich with his mercy. You're rich with with his justice. You're converted. You're justified. You're adopted into his family. You're being sanctified. You will be glorified. You have hope. You were dead. Now you're alive, right? Dead in your trespasses and sins. Now you're alive. You were forsaken, but now you're forgiven. You were lost, but now you're fine. You were blind, but now you See, those are the riches of Christ poured out on you as you trust in him. And it it goes on. There's more to that. Yes, theologically, we understand sanctification, justification. We're saved. Okay, great. But even in our lives, as we're as we're living day to day, those riches are poured out on us. Do you know why? Because before you're a Christian, you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to figure out life. When you're a Christian, you do know what it's all about. You have the word. You understand. You could see what sin is. You understand that. You know what God's will is. You know what right is. You know what wrong is. You have that standard. So everything changes. Amen? Praise God. We have that. Before Jesus Christ, you're searching for an identity. You're just trying, who am I? In Christ, you are established in Jesus Christ. You know who you are in him. You know that you belong to him. You want to please him. His ways become your ways. You you are his. You're an instrument in the hand of your redeemer. You love him, and he loves you. Before Christ, you're trying to find happiness. 
in Christ, you know true joy. You know true contentment. Apart from Christ, there's always a restless, how am I going to be happy? What do I need to do? Blah, 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 this and that. In Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean every second is perfect. Don't get me wrong in that way. But you know if you're a Christian today that there is joy and contentment no matter the circumstance. I don't need anybody else but Jesus Christ. You could take it all and you could have it all. Just give me Jesus and I'll know contentment and peace. Right? Our identities in him. You might be desperate for stability apart from Christ to having real peace in Jesus Christ. That's part of the riches. It says right here, he bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. And then this is why we go. Verse 14, how will they call upon him who they not believed? How are they to believe in him who they've never heard of? And how can they hear without somebody to preach the message? And how do we preach unless they are sent as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the, this is why we do it. This is why we go. This is why we preach it. This is why we take it to the ends of the earth. We take it everywhere to everyone, right? It's just like if you discovered the cure to a terrible disease, you're not going to keep it, right? If we discovered the cure to cancer, we're going to take it everywhere we go. You're not just going to keep it to yourself. Oh, we have this little, it's just for these people over here. No, you're going to take it far and wide. Here, we have this. Well, the gospel truly is much better than any cure for the worst of diseases. Because in the gospel is the power to forgive you of your sins, to grant you eternal life, to give you hope, to give you a life worth living even now, and death becomes something not to be afraid of. The Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what the gospel does, and that's why we go. That's why he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings. Going back to Isaiah 52 in verse 7. It's beautiful because this message that we deliver, what I just spoke of, that message is a message that transforms lives. Do you understand? If you're a Christian this morning, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what you were and now who and what you are in Christ, right? You know the power of the gospel that changes. It does change lives. And as people are converted, it transforms societies as well. It's good. It's good news. That's why we take it. That's why we're earnest about it. That's why we bring it forth. It's like, if you're starving, you've seen those pictures of people that are just starving and they're just about to die. And then they look out on the horizon and here comes the trucks. Here comes the trucks filled with food. That's what the gospel is like. It's that life-saving gospel. It brings hope. It fills us up. It's bringing water to the thirsty. That's what this is. Whenever and wherever the true gospel takes hold, listen, lives are profoundly changed and eventually cultures are transformed. That's a fact. That's a fact of history. You can look it up. And I'm talking about true Christianity. I'm not talking about when it goes off the rails, but purest, biblical, truly converted Christians living in the world. You have transformations of hearts and eventually of cultures. Let's think about Rome. Think, Go back to Rome itself. Do you remember the Philippian jailer from Acts 16? He was, a, he was a jailer. He was a prison guard. He had Paul and Silas in prison. He wasn't their friend. He wasn't looking at them. He was keeping them in bondage and chains. After he was converted, what did he do? He brought them to his house. He fed them. He cleansed them. He cared for them. He washed their wounds. He loved them. He heard the gospel, was converted, and was baptized by them. Right? So even in early Rome, the influence of Christians was very strong. There was a thing that they would do if, okay, we have abortion today. Back then it wasn't as sophisticated, but what they would do, they would take their baby infants as soon as they were born, and they would put them out in a place, certain place, the edge of town, the outskirts of town, and it was called exposure. And we have letters to this effect. One soldier was writing to his wife saying, if it's a girl put her out. If it's a boy, keep him. And that's what they would do. So they would take the infants and they would just put them out there and whatever happened, happened. If a wild animal came along, a lot of times people would take them and raise them as slaves or use them for sex trafficking in that way. True. This is true. When the gospel came to Rome and people were converted the Christians were not only keeping their children, but they were going to these places to these where they would dump the kids and take the child and adopt that child into their family. 
and give them that life and hope. You see how culture changes? It goes from death to life. It does have a true impact because we are truly transformed by the Lord. It was the Christians who were very instrumental in, in ending the gladiatorial games in Rome because of their influence, because of, especially after Constantine, but even before them, just laws, equality. Philemon was a slaveholder. Onesimus was a slave who had run away. Paul says, I'm sending him back to you, not just as a servant, but as a brother in Christ. So there's equality there in Christ Jesus. We stand, the ground, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's peace and there's truth where Christianity takes hold. You need to understand this. You could sketch through history. Again, not perfectly, not in anything of all the, the bad examples and so forth, but I'm talking about pure biblical transformation, starting with hearts and lives. It does go out into the society. And our country was founded on those principles. I know what you're hearing in the schools today, and I know what you're hearing in universities today. There's a lot of falsehood there. There might be some truth in some of the, some of the ways, but this nation was truly founded. Our founding fathers would and said that this constitution was meant for a moral and upstanding people. It won't survive apart from that. So much of our laws are based on scripture, that the justice system and the fairness that's included in that. So much of the blessing of our nation, the freedom that we have based on biblical principles, the opportunity, the justice and the grace. The blessedness that we've had for so that's long gone right now in our country, but it certainly was with education, with hospitals. Think about early on the, the names of the hospitals. Remember back in the day, Saint what? Saint, it was the Christians who cared for life. So they were preserving life in that way. Right? Presbyterian Hospital, Mercy Hospital. What do you think? Now it's not like that anymore. The schools, the college, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all founded by Christians to know more about God, to learn, to understand, to educate. That's, these are all blessings from God that we've had. They're, they're pretty much out the window now, but it's beautiful. He says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings. Beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. And let me tell you why. Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, it's beautiful because the gospel cannot be imposed upon you. Do you know that? We can't impose Christianity on you. I wish that we could in some ways. You know, I wish everybody was saved and know the Lord. But we can't do that. It has to be the Holy Spirit. We understand that. We preach the gospel. There's great freedom in that, man. I can't guilt you into being a Christian. People will try all the time, you know. Oh, you're going to do this. This is going to happen to you. You know, God's not going to... All these things. Try to guilt you. Try to force you. Try to make you. No. The gospel is freely given. That's what's so beautiful about it. That's why it's beautiful. It's a message that's freely given and freely received. And Christians will still love you and they'll still pray for you even if you reject them and hate them. It doesn't matter. You can hate me, dis despise me all you want, call me this, call me that, call me the other thing, put us in prison. Whatever you do, we're still going to love you and we're still going to pray for you because we know that you need Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? And that's the mentality and the attitude that we must have. We're not going to reject you. Well, then people will say, oh, no, you Christians are bigoted. You're homophobic. You're transphobic. You're this, you're that. And the other thing, let me tell you something, man. You want to talk about these ideas? The reason we're not for them is because they're antithetical, they're antithetical to God's law. They're antithetical to God's word, to God's design, to God's will. And there's always bad consequences for them. But I'll tell you what, if there's a person who's in that lifestyle, person that's going to come alongside you when there's trouble is going to be Christian. Do you understand that? Do you know that? You know in the early 80s when AIDS hit, it was, if you're, for those of you that are younger, it was kind of like with COVID, not as much in the general public, but especially in the homosexual community, people were just scared and afraid because of the devastation. There was no cure. Didn't know what it was. Well, what's happening in New York City especially, and I can attest to this, I can give you the proof for this, you can ask me, what was going on there, not much of the times the hospital weren't taking them because they didn't know what it was, they were afraid. The community itself, the homosexual community, was very afraid. The families weren't going to take them back in that way. So what did they do? To people that were dying with AIDS, young men who were dying with AIDS, were brought to the sleaziest part of town in New York, in the sleaziest motels, and they were just thrown in there, rat-infested, Insect infested, just infested, just laying there, just laying there to die. Do you know who went? Do you know who went? It was the Christians. It was the pastors. Now, not all Christians, don't get me wrong. There were those who were standing on high and all this adjunction from God and so forth. But those who went to minister in the midst of the pain 
were the pastors, were the Christians, and they were praying for, and they were caring for, and they were holding their hands while they were dying on that way. So don't tell me that Christians don't love and don't care. It's just not the way you want us. They would like us to love and care in full acceptance. We love them because we love their soul. And that's the attitude, and that's the mentality that we must have as Christians. And that's what makes the gospel beautiful, because we cannot impose it upon you. You understand? You go somewhere else, and that, and you, a system is going to be imposing. Let's take Islam, for example, right now, because it's in the news again. That subjection, you need to understand that. It is imposed upon you. They will attempt to convert you, if you're Muslim. If not, you will be subjugated, or you will be killed. You'll be a slave, or you will be killed. And that is the reality. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. Bottom line, bottom line, because you have people saying, oh, that's not really it. It's a, it's a religion of love. It's this. No, no, no. What you're seeing happening right now in the world today and in the Middle East is actually the faith being practiced faithfully. This is how it is taught. This is how it is practiced. Oh, no, there's just a few... No, 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 no. Let me ask you a question. How many Muslims... Do you hear speaking out against the atrocities that are going on? Very few. And let me tell you why. Number one, if you're a moderate Muslim, then you're afraid because they'll get you too because it doesn't matter. <laughs> once, once you're in, in that position of strength, you get you too. So they're afraid or they believe it themselves because that is the core of their doctrine. See, So it's going to be imposed upon you. Don't get me. The Muslims are not going to be nice to you if they're in power. and going to say, oh, would you please convert? Would you please believe? I'll pray for you if you don't. No, 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 no. If you don't, well, then you're going to be subjugated to them or killed. Bottom line. Understand, this is a reality check. You need to understand this. You need to know this. That's why the gospel is beautiful, because it cannot be imposed. We pray, we love you, and we bring the hope of, good, of the good news. Right? Number two, it's beautiful because it loves enough to speak the truth. That's what it does. It does tell you the truth. It does talk about sin. We have to, because that's our problem. That's the deal. It loves you enough to tell the truth. We are living in a world right now. Do you know we're living in a world at this time where love, love means affirming me. Love means accepting me. Love means endorsing my decisions, no matter how misguided, no matter how unhealthy, no matter how sinful they are. If you love me, you're just going to support me. You're going to empathize. You're going to say, okay, yes, that's right. No, that's crazy, isn't it? If you really love somebody, you're going to tell them the truth. If you have a brother who's a drug addict, you're not going to say, oh, I love you, Tommy. Here, here's more drugs. You know, this shows my love for you that I'm, that I'm, that I'm just feeding these to you because I I hate to see you going through withdrawal, and I know you kind of need these, so, so here's how I love you. I'm just going to feed these to you. Is that love? That's not love. That's not love. That's, that's a misguided kind of love. Oh, compassion. Give them this. Give them that. So they, no. No, well, that's, that's, you're just feeding that. Is that love? Or is love compassionately saying, no, it's wrong. It's sinful. It's going to kill you, man. You can't do this. See, that's love. But when you love them like that, guess what happens? Repercussions. None of us wants to feel bad. None of us wants to be, you know, hated or whatever. So we, so, so we hesitate. Because when you tell people that you love the things that they don't really want to hear, if you don't affirm them, guess what happens to you? You get the guilt trips. Oh, you don't really love me. You don't know my situation. You don't understand me. Blah, blah, blah. This, that, and the other thing. They get angry. How dare you say this about me? This is my life. How and they write you off. Welcome to Christianity, Christianity 101. Because you love them with the love of Christ and the gospel, you tell the truth, get ready. Jesus said, if you love me, the world will not love you because you're confronting them with what they need the most. Meanwhile, you really do love them because it's exactly what they do need is Christ. You understand? It's very clear in that way. You could truly love them with the truth or you can love them straight to death. What are you going to do? See, that's what he says here. That's why it's, that's why the feet of those who bring the gospel are beautiful because it tells you the truth of what you need to know about yourself, about our problem, and about the solution. The world needs the truth and it needs the gospel because we are living in a world that's filled with lies right now, man. We need light because we're living in deep darkness and you know that there's a darkness in this world today. We need to bring objective truth in a world that's living in a subjective, relativistic, relativistic way. You understand? You know that? We're just living in that way. We have so successfully, at least in this country, have gotten rid of God and the idea of God 
Again, what this nation was founded upon, in the public square, politicians, go look at our history, okay? We have so successfully gotten rid of God in our government. We've gotten rid of God in our schools. We've gotten rid of God in public square. You don't hear much about God in the public square. Entertainment, for sure, in our homes, in our churches, and even in our personal lives. We've, we've so successfully gotten rid of him that what was considered wrong yesterday is considered right and noble today. Do you know that? Things that you would have been ashamed of are now practiced very proudly, and we're accepting it. Our morality, our values are based right now on the latest consensus on TikTok, Twitter, X, whatever it is. We're living at a time right now, man, where the absurd is treated as reasonable. Even five years ago, we used, that's absurd. Now it's reasonable. Where personal feelings, my personal feelings, trump objective truth. Where my personal happiness is the chief and highest priority in pursuit in my life. I'm living, what's, what's the next thrill? What's the next, you know, the next relationship, the next drug that I'm gonna, gonna move on to? It's a restless search for love, meaning, and purpose. You will not find it outside of Jesus Christ. That's why the feet that bring the gospel are beautiful. We're living in a time where fantasy and irrationality is accepted as fact. You know that? You understand that? We're living in a time right now where a boy can be a girl. In the mind. Where women can be men. And we're buying it. And you will be punished if you don't agree with it. Where a 67-year-old man, and we can show you on YouTube, identifies as a five-year-old girl, and you have to treat him like a five-year-old girl. Where a little kid identifies as a cat, and you have to have a, a litter box in your classroom. It's funny, but it's not. It's sad because it's true, and they're, this is reality. They're not saying, no, 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 honey, that's fantasy. It's reality for them, and you must treat it as such. You understand? This is so antithetical to God. It's, 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 it's the other, where young children rule the household. Who's in charge of the household these days? It's the kids. Where adults act like teenagers. Oh, it's not so bad. It's still good. We still have things in our life. Oh, pastor, you're just, you're exaggerating. I'm not. I wish I were. It's become normal because we've accepted it, but it's not. Now, let me tell you something. It's normal. We've accepted that in the name of compassion, you can have people walking into stores, walking into Walmart. I don't know about Target. Walking into Walmart for sure. Drug stores, CVS, Walgreens. Why do you think they're closing down? Many of them. Because you can walk into these stores. You could fill up your cart and just walk right out. Certain people can. Right? With no moral obligation before God. See, that would be wrong. You would say, that is stealing. Imagine you have your own business. You work so hard. You get that product. You buy that product. And all of a sudden, people just come into your store, man, and take anything that they want off the shelves, walk out, and you can do nothing about that. See, they feel no... They First of all, they have a moral obligation before God. That is called stealing. Thou shalt not steal. That is a sin. They're taking something that doesn't belong to them, that they haven't earned, that they do not deserve in that way. Now, if you want to give them stuff, you can do that all day long, but you can't not steal personal property. If you have your own business, well, that's just nice and compassionate. Nice and compassionate. They're going to take everything you have. Customers are going to be afraid to come into your store. You're not going to have enough money. Your people are going to be quitting left and right because they're afraid. They're fearful. You're not going to have inventory. You're not going to have money. Your business is going to close. You're not going to have food for your family or the community. How compassionate is that? It's sinful. It's wrong. But see how twisted things are right now? We say, oh, that's they need it. They don't they're taking and selling it. They're not selling the drugs. There's no more obligation before God or man. No shame, no guilt, no problem. If people living on the streets, man, in your neighborhoods, in your neighborhoods, and you have to walk there, and it's like scary, but hey, that's compassion. That's, that's not compassion. That's not love. We're just allowing sin openly to fester in that way. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse unless we do something about it. You're putting these people up in high-rise apartments, beautiful apartments in New York City, and these, you know, have you heard? Some of this, putting them up in four-star hotels. What are they doing? They're trashing these hotels. They're getting rid of people. But we have to show compassion and love. It's twisted. But see, this is what sin does. This is why the, the, the gospel is so beautiful, because it brings order, it brings structure even to society. Right? This is not beautiful, these things. It's ugly. It's scary. It's wrong. It's sin unchecked. And these are the results. So what are the results? When you take the gospel out, okay, you've gotten rid of God, you've gotten rid of the gospel, you've gotten rid of everything. Where do we find ourselves? Hmm? You feel safe? You feel secure? You feel happy? You feel like you know where you're going in life? You feel 
You know what's going to happen after death? I don't mean to sound hard. I'm just saying, man, we can't do, we need, we need the Lord. We need the word. It's not beautiful. That's why he says, it's beautiful when the gospel comes, when that good news comes. Those feet are beautiful because of the news that they're delivering. Apart from that, it's ugly. It's scary and it's wrong. It's sin unchecked. So what are the results? We're living at a time right now, a government that was founded on biblical principles. That's why we had three branches of government, because these guys knew the hearts of man. We know how sinful we are. So it's not, it doesn't have a king or one ruler. You're going to have three branches to counteract each other, to balance each other out. Okay, you're wrong here, you're wrong there. But apart from God, that's not going to work as we're finding out today. We have a government that's abdicated their sworn duty to protect, preserve, and to promote life. How safe do you feel if you live in this city? For real. And in this country, as a matter of fact. Equal justice? Huh, that's becoming a joke. All right? Stability, promoting stability? No, they're promoting disorder, even our government. That's apart from God. Homes are broken. Let's face it. Families are in disarray. And what's a, what constitutes a family today? A mom, a dad, and kids? Um, in-laws? I was going to say outlaws. In-laws? <laughs> right? No, we don't know. What constitutes, whatever, whatever we want a family to be. Forget about what God's design, will, and purpose is for family. We want our own idea of family. Okay. Heather has two mommies. Tommy has two daddies. Homes are in disarray. We have men who refuse to take responsibility to lead their families, to protect their families, to provide for their families, and to love their families. We have women who mother their husbands rather than compliment them. Right? That little Garvin go over there, play with his little games, plays little video games while mommy's working and doing everything else she needs to be doing. We have we, and, and covers for her husband. This is wrong. We have children in charge of it. Parents are treating their kids as peers, especially when they become teenagers, 12 and 13. They're laying things on them that 12 and 13, 14, 15 year olds shouldn't know what's going on in their families. Right? How terrible their dad is. How awful their life is. What about their new boyfriend coming into that? that that's, see, that's not biblical. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not stability. That's not grace. Our society is heading over a cliff. That's why we need these beautiful feet to bring the gospel. Chaos, confusion, avoidance. We're living in avoidance, man. How are we doing this? We're just entertaining ourselves to death. The next thrill is another. And again, it's, it's cool to have fun. It's all right. I'm not saying that within the context, but we're just kind of, I'm so much reminded how the Roman Empire fell in so many ways. They, because that's exactly what they were doing. When, when the barbarians were coming at the gate, what were the Romans doing? They were, they were partying. They were eating and drinking. They were at the games. They were, you know, making sure they were having their entertainment, their fun, their philosophy. Exactly what we're doing today. Again, businesses closing, people fleeing, people frightened in cities. Many schools have turned into not learning centers. Our schools aren't learning centers anymore. You need to understand, even if you graduated five or ten years ago, our schools are not learning centers right now. They're centers of indoctrination where critical race theory, LGBTQ ideology is taking over. Not a, no doubt. No doubt about that. Droves of good teachers are leaving. They're not telling you this. I have a daughter who could be a wonderful teacher in public school who can't teach because of these things. Right? It's happening. Culture of death from abortion to euthanasia. Just accept it. Right? Just time for me to die. Time for me to go. It's, you know, don't want this baby in me, so I'm just going to do that. We're sitting as millions around the world watch and celebrate with Hamas as Israelis are slaughtered. This is, this is the ugliness of the world apart from where these are the results. When you could sit there and say, that's wonderful, where people are decapitated and they're stepping on their heads, where babies are murdered. Are you kidding me? This is a world apart from God. This is how ugly it is. Where churches have abandoned the book, they're not going to tell you the truth, they're going to tell you what you want to hear because they want their churches to be big and they want to be entertainment centers, so they just go real easy and light on things like sin your need for repentance, and your hope in Jesus Christ. This is where we find ourselves. People are doing their own thing, opting for alternatives, from New Age spirituality to Satanism. You know, Satanism is rising so quickly and so fast around us, in this country for sure, and around the world. I could go on and on and on. What about personal results? This is, this is why the gospel, the feet that bring the gospel is so beautiful, because it's the antithesis of what I'm telling you right now. 
personal. People are restless, drifting, confused. There's a record rate of people in therapy. Who's not in therapy today? Somebody's always in therapy. Oh, my therapist says this. Therapist says that. I'm not you know, just saying all oh, therapy is terrible. But everybody's in therapy, and nobody's really getting any better. It's just kind of continuing on and on and on. Right? Suicide is on the rise. A lot of these therapists don't even know what to tell people anymore because at one time, these things, certain things were wrong. Okay, you're struggling, struggling with transgender? Well, that's an issue. Let's talk about it. Now you can't even say that that's wrong. You have to affirm that. It's right. Right? We're looking for something. There's a selfishness. We're looking for something to hide the pain, to gain popularity, to be loved. And do you know we're the most lonely that we've ever been? Go look it up. Go, go look up loneliness. People are lonely. It doesn't matter how much entertainment they're surrounded with, how many people they surround themselves with. At the end of the day, they're lonely because they don't have a purpose. They don't have meaning. They don't have identity except in what they find around them. It's so ironic that we're living in a world right now where everybody is getting everything that they want. This is what people wanted. No more God. Get rid of your God. Get rid of all that stuff. Let me be free. Let me be myself. Let me be who I want to be. Let me be who I feel I am. Let me be who I think I really am. Okay, you got it. You've got it. That's where we're at today in this place. They have gotten everything that they've wanted, the freedom from God, but they find only fleeting satisfaction and still have no purpose, no meaning, no hope, and no peace. St. Augustine was right when he said that the heart is restless, Lord, until it finds its rest in you. That's the truth. And this is the opportunity for us. So I'll say all these things to tell you, this is why the feet of those who bring the gospel are beautiful. Because it's the gospel that shows us our problem. It's the gospel that gives the solution. It's the gospel that reaches our deepest needs and meets them in Jesus Christ. Amen and praise God. That is it. That is where hope, meaning, purpose is found. That is where life is found. We know, as I said earlier, now we do know the truth. We have the truth. We see it clearly. We're not in it for ourselves. We're in it for him completely because he has saved us for no other reason than he has saved us. And we know that we will be with him for all eternity. That's why Paul said, and I'll say it again, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain because I know I'm going to be in your presence. So today is the day of salvation. Trust in him. Love him. Know him. As we always should have been, but especially now, Christians, we need to proclaim the good news. We need to be those beautiful feet that bring the good news of the gospel. And we need to live out those gospel implications in our life. For far too long, we have sat on the sidelines of we've watched just the darkness close in on us without saying anything, without doing anything, except from afar. We've gotten our own little pietistic world of churchy things and la 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 di da. No. No, you should be taking your faith into the workplace. You should be saying, no, I will not do that. You should be willing to, to proclaim Christ and gospel no matter what it costs you. And it will cost you, no doubt. It might cost you your job if you say, no. If you say, I'm not going to use those pronouns. If I'm not going to, because that's not love. So be ready for that. It's not without consequence, but that's what we need to be doing. We need to be living boldly. We need to be in front of the abortion clinics. We need to be down at City Hall. We need to be speaking truth into the lies. We need to bring light into the darkness as Christians. Always with love, but always with determination, and always knowing that he changes hearts boldly, confidently in Christ. We need to show the world who we are and to tell the world about Jesus and then watch the transformation take place individually, one person at a time, and then corporately.